Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Faisal. I'm a medical doctor, <coughs> and uh, I have a master's law. Uh, sorry, master of laws in medical law, at the Liverpool University, and I'm working as a medical legal and quality assurance executive as uh, at, at ADK Hospital. Um, when I was asked, approached by uh, uh, Bind Talks to give a talk, I was thinking the first thing that came to my mind was what I do may be a lot of interest to me, but uh, uh, whether it would be interest of the others, uh, to, and then why sh I should talk about myself in front of an uh, audience that I don't really know. But uh, I, um, according to uh, Gans, he tells that uh, we who uh, do public work, we have an, actually a responsibility to tell our story, uh, to give an account, to give a public account of what we do and why we do it and where we want, us, we want to lead. And most importantly, I found this really interesting because uh, if we don't tell our story, others will. And that may not be the way we like it. It may not be the accurate one. So I thought, okay, I should really tell my story. And um, so this is my story of uh, why I became a healthcare rebel. So my story, like, uh, like any other, starts uh, from childhood and um, I had a very uneventful childhood in the sense that I don't have any um, bad memories of my childhood. I was uh, raised, uh, I, I'm from an island, I was uh, raised by my uncles, my parents. They were away, my f mother, mother had passed away when I was about three, so I have no real memories of her. And my father was working in an island, so I re didn't have much guidance, which was the only plus point of it was that I was independent. There was really nobody to mold me or to influence my thoughts or to tell this, okay, you have to be this particular person. And um, I went to school, I was really a nerd, I was into books and uh, that was the only friend sort of I had and I, I took my solace in uh, reading books and uh, not only particularly but the textbooks, but uh, I would read from everything, any book that I could get. And uh, uh, I was very timid. I remember in grade 10, I think, uh, I was in English literature and the teacher would ask me to read a passage from a book and I would just sit there and uh, without doing anything. And uh, even in English debates or even in talks, I would just stand at the podium and just be frozen. I knew I had to do it, but then I might do that again also right now, so just to be uh, just a warning. Um, and I, I, I uh, the fox and the hedgehog, uh, that was my motto, that was something I read a long time back. I would rather be a fox that uh, knows a lot of many things rather than the hedgehog that knows a big one thing. So that was how I defined myself. I would read from everything. I would, even in medical school after which I would take later on, I was into many things. Rather than just reading about anatomy and physiology, I would read into uh, why we were trying to become doctors, what was the role of doctors, rather than just uh, focusing on medicine itself. So IGMH, I went as a stepping stone to go into medicine. And there was one incident that happened that really sort of pushed me into going into medicine. I remember there was a time when uh, uh, there was, uh, sorry, uh, presentations were going and I would sneak into the back end and just to listen to the doctors. And there was one doctor who asked me whether I was a doctor. And I said, no, I w I'm just a clinical assistant. And then uh, uh, she said that, uh, no, I should be a doctor if I have to be there because you wouldn't understand it, what they were saying. But I really understood what they were talking about and I thought, yes, I had to become a doctor if I went to be in this particular group. So I went to medical school in Nepal and then uh, uh, it was a nice place, people were very fine. Uh, as long as, as uh, you tell them that you are from Maldives, they are happy. But the problem is uh, when they see us first, uh, they will tell, think that we are Indian, so they have a frown on their face. But the moment you say that they are, we are from Maldives, then it's a smile and uh, everybody is welcome. So uh, become, I was uh, becoming a doctor was a real uh, sort of a struggle for me in the sense that not uh, uh, study-wise, everything. I really like studying the anatomy and the physiology and the, how the human body worked. But the real question was why I was becoming a doctor. I was asked by my seniors why I became a doctor, why I wanted to become a doctor. And in that group, I remember uh, they were telling, uh, I, I answered that I wanted to help people and everybody laughed. And uh, they said, this is just, just a, such a childish answer. I was confused. I mean, I said, no, I really wanted to help people. That was the reason I wanted to become a doctor. 
But uh, it was just, uh, I didn't understand why they laughed, and, um, but it was something that really stuck with me. So uh, the other thing that stuck with me, with me was this dead man who taught me. His name is Guy. I used to call him Guy. We have in our dissection, uh, anatomy dissection classes, we have four bodies that are divided into <coughs> the groups. And on each side, like on the right side, there will be six person dissecting, and on the le left side, there will be six people dissecting. And I was you know, sort of leading one group. And one day when I came, there was this uh, uh, mark on the, our cadaver's body. It was G-U-Y. Somebody had done it. For some reason, it really ticked me off. I was, I was, I was infuriated. I, I did not understand the reason why it got me so angry. But I made a lot of fuss, and then I asked uh, my uh, professor whether this was all right. And he said, no, probably not. But he did not give any much of a concrete answer as to why we should not be desecrating a human body. That got me into thinking as to, I mean, if we are doctors, when we become doctors, if we can desecrate a human body, even if it is a dead body, what will we do to the uh, others? Like, uh, that, that sort of confused me as to the role of doctors. What are we really trying to do? Are we just uh, focusing on the human body and systems or uh, whether we should be really respecting the person even if the person is dead. So I think uh, that objectification of the human body, uh, reducing the human person into uh, organ systems with diseases that to be treated, it stuck with me for a long time. Even now I'm struggling with that. For example, uh, when I'm working here, um, oh, sorry, um, interesting. So I was uh, in a bit of a confusion as to there was no guidance as to uh, um, where I should get this answer. I remember having one medical ethics class. It was just one hour. I was really hoping that we, should, we would be having more of the classes. But unfortunately, throughout the six and a half years of medical school, it never happened. So I found uh, um, art as a therapy, as, as a, a tool. Uh, as a creative outlet and to assert my independence. Because medical school, although it is fascinating, although it has a lot of information, it was very rigid. You had to read the books and then um, there was not much of a question that you could ask because it was everything was set. The human body, as you know, it doesn't change. And uh, you had to uh, uh, by heart everything. You had to by heart where the muscles were, the bones were. And that was it. There was no room for question. But uh, that was not how I was, uh, my mind uh, frame was. I was always asking questions and uh, I thought I have to go some, I, I should seek something that I should get solace from. So I went to art and um, this is what actually sort of uh, uh, supported me throughout the medical school, art, abstract art in particular, because I was able to control, okay, which color was there. There was nobody telling me, okay, uh, if it is abstract art, I can determine when the painting is finished, when it was done, what color I can use. Even the title, I could name it myself. It is different from any other form of art. So uh, anyway, I finished medical school. I returned with a medical degree. And um, I came with a beautiful wife and an adorable son and joined IGMH. Uh, IGMH, again, there was a big question that I, that's, um, whether I should be the doctor who was just treating the person, who was just treating the uh, diseases of the person, or should I expect, uh, refuse to accept the status quo? This was a question again that, I, that stuck with me. I went to regional hospital, uh, Gun Regional Hospital, where I was the doctor. I was treating people without any supervision. People were harmed under my care also, but there was no sort of uh, redressal for the patients. Even the patients, they did not understand whether they, being, they were being harmed. I'm not telling that patients uh, go through this. Medicine is a rewarding thing, and uh, all the doctors who they are doing a huge service to the community. But I think it is medicine is a profession, a noble profession, only when it is uh, uh, practiced the way it should be, with a focus on the patient. The patients deserve more. And we have the oath, but then where was the oath? That was my question. We were. Uh, sitting in groups talking about other patients, uh, the, quest, the first question would uh, come to my mind was, uh, where is the patient confidentiality? Where is the patient's right to privacy? So these questions lingered and uh, I thought I have to step out of my comfort zone of being a doctor. 
So I went to the Ministry of Health. I, I left my clinical practice very soon, as soon as I started it. And um, there again, I faced much more challenges because I'm just a junior doctor. I'm an MBBS Adag doctor coming and questioning uh, others. And uh, I got these uh, sort of answers. You can't teach old dogs new tricks. Because I was talking about incident reporting. I was uh, talking about listening to the patient party. I was talking about apologizing to the patients when things go wrong. I was talking about really putting the f uh, patient in the focus of what we do. And uh, when things go wrong also, I have to go to these consultants and then ask them, OK, what really went wrong? And they would say, I'm not a surgeon, so I, I wouldn't understand what is happening really in the operation theater. So I thought, uh, but even then, I thought that I should be able to create change. So, so I thought I had to build my self-efficacy if I am to uh, make this change. So I applied for scholarships. I got, uh, fortunately, I got scholarships in medical law and medical ethics, uh, two at the same time. Again, which was a struggle because I didn't know which one I had to choose because both were equally interesting to me. So I went to the ministry, I went to the uh, minister and said, okay, I have this scholarship, will you uh, be funding me for my living expenses? And they said yes, and uh, we had to uh, go through the formal process and uh, you know how the ministry works, they gave the scholarship to somebody else. And uh, But <laughs> I did not uh, stop there, I went into the minister's room, I said, oh, this is very unfair because I've been working in this, uh, uh, for, I left clinical practice, I was working at a pay of 10,000 rupiah just to make sure that our health system improves. But uh, fortunately, she, uh, they did uh, uh, give the scholarship back to me. So I went to uh, Liverpool, which was and spent one of my best years uh, out of uh, <coughs> of my life in Liverpool, and uh, got myself a Master of Laws in Medical Law and came. And I'm still being the rebel. I did not return uh, to the big, big, uh, back to the Ministry of Health because I thought if I am to improve the system, I have to get out of it. There are so many things. I, I think if you look at the newspaper, so we have so many things going wrong in our health system. But still, I think uh, we, we should be able to correct those. And uh, at ADK Hospital right now, what I'm doing is I'm rocking the boat, but still managing to stay in. I'm still part of the medical fraternity. I believe that I am still a doctor first and foremost. But I think we need to be able to have the courage to question them when things go wrong. So I'm basically protecting patients and uh, uh, doctors together. When people ask, I said, no, because I feel that I'm really looking after the patients and looking after the doctors when I'm uh, overseeing their, how they think, uh, what they are doing. So we have implemented a lot of procedures at ADK Hospital that are not existing in the, uh, in the uh, in the ministry or at the national levels. We have a patient complaints mechanism, we have ethics committees, and uh, we put patients first uh, in everything we do. At least we try to do that. And it is a big challenge because it is a change in culture. And when I told uh, actually uh, this to my son, uh, because he used to ask me why I don't carry my stethoscope now and then, uh, and then I told this uh, that I'm trying to do this. And then this is what he simplified. It and said, so your job is to remind doctors to be nice to their patients. I think this is basically, it uh, sums up what I do. I mean, um, I, if with every incident, with every patient party that we have to talk to, to apologize to, to explain to the patient party, okay, this is what went wrong in your care. I go back to the doctor and I ask them, okay, this is what has happened. So I, I, as doctors in the busy uh, life of providing care, uh, we tend to forget that patients are the reason why we exist. And we have to, uh, actually each, each time something goes wrong, it is an opportunity for me to tell them uh, patients should be the focus of care. So, but uh, it doesn't come without anything. So am I the troublemaker or the rebel? Uh, that is the question that I, even I myself ask. But uh, the difference is troublemakers always complain uh, rather than creating uh, opportunities. Uh, they would be focusing on themselves rather than on the mission. And they will be angry rather than being passionate. And they are alone rather than, uh, and they, they, they alienate themselves rather than try to team build. So I guess I am a rebel, but then uh, uh, what happens is I get labeled as a terrorizer, as the harasser of the doctors. So I remember one time when uh, uh, a, patient part, a patient had died and then I asked the doctor to go and please explain to the patient party why the patient had passed away. 
at least they require an explanation. And um, the response was, why are you terrorizing me? Can you not do that? And uh, again, I, in, on another occasion also, I go and ask them, okay, can you please, can you please uh, explain to the, be nice to your colleagues at least, and uh, talk nicely to your uh, patients, because patients uh, need uh, to be treated with respect and dignity. And uh, Afal gets some, uh, our MD, he gets a message saying harassment by Dr. Faisal. So basically it is very difficult uh, position that I am in. I am leveled as a heretic. Uh, you know what happened to heretics uh, in the old days, you get burned at the stake, but now you get uh, burnt on Facebook and on Twitter. Those who follow me on Facebook will know that I, all my posts are based on uh, protecting uh, the patient's rights and advocacy, advocating for patient's rights. But then the comments you get from doctors and uh, healthcare providers are really staggering. I mean, it's as if they really don't get it. So I was thinking that yes, maybe uh, I am just a lone nut who is dancing around, not getting uh, others, not getting what uh, I am really talking about. But uh, there is hope basically in the family. I have a, a lovely family that I can always uh, count on to get hope. In the workplace, I'm very thankful. I'm not just saying because our father is here, but uh, it is an opportunity uh, in the workplace. We get an opportunity to do this. Uh, recently, what we did was uh, we re removed the restrictions on our visiting hours. We thought that, okay, patients need to be uh, uh, able to bring their family relatives whenever they wanted. I know if I, it was an IGMS, they would give me, give me 50 reasons for not doing it. But within two days, we were able to implement it at ADDK. So from starting from tomorrow, we will be able to we'll remove the restriction on visiting hours, except in the ICU, of course. And uh, of, I'm finding hope in all the opportunities that I get, like the scholarships. And recently, again, uh, by, uh, when I visited the um, Healthcare Quality Forum in Paris, uh, I made a pledge to spark a revolution in Maldives healthcare system, which was actually part of an assignment. We had to go atop <coughs> the Arc de Triomphe in France, in Paris, and then uh, take a selfie of ourselves holding a pledge. So my pledge was to spark a revolution in the Maldives healthcare system. So this actually inspired a lot of people. There were about 3,000 uh, or so delegates at the uh, forum. And uh, this was uh, featured and uh, on the last day of the forum, I have about 60 or so uh, Scottish delegate, the whole of the Scottish team coming up on stage and pledging that they would help me to improve our health system. So these are the things that we find hope in. So why I am a heretic uh, healthcare rebel? Because I, I cannot accept the status quo. I, I do not believe that this should be our, how our health system should be without uh, uh, regard to the patient's rights. And uh, I want to live my convictions and values, uh, which is that, again, it all come back to, uh, comes back to justice, that patients are, should be the first point of care. We have to uh, center everything around the patient. And I believe I can create change. I think we have been able to do that uh, slowly. It is a huge challenge because it is a change in culture that we have to bring about. And uh, it is always rebels and heretics who bring about change. Whatever has happened, if you look from Galileo to anybody, it is always the uh, like-minded few who has been able to bring about a change. So I'll just leave uh, with these two quotes just to uh, sort of get you, urge you to becoming the rebel rather than accepting the status quo. So to believe in something and not to live it is dishonest, which I think is very true. And our lives begin to end the day, we become silent about things that really matter. So for me, it, uh, the, what matters is patient care, patient rights. And that is how, that is why I have become a healthcare rebel. Thank you.